Defenses to breach of contract claims. There are a number of defenses available to counter a breach of contract claim. The defendant can challenge the validity of the contract on the grounds of formation. If there was no meeting of the minds, no intent to enter the contract, then the contract may not exist. A contract could be invalidated through lack of capacity. Misconduct in the bargaining process, such as duress and misrepresentation, could form a valid defence. Also an agreement that is unconscionable, excessively unfair, will sometimes be unenforceable in court. Certain contracts, such as the sale of real estate or contracts of a certain dollar value, are required to be in writing. Lack of a writing will form a defence in certain situations. A change in circumstances, resulting from a later unforeseen event, can render a contract unenforceable on grounds of impossibility, impracticability or frustration of purpose. If no contract was actually formed, then a breach of contract claim has no merit. As we can see in the slideshow on formation, there are a number of ways that contract formation can be defective. Written formal contracts are the easiest to identify. But as we know, contracts can also be formed in exchange of correspondence such as email, fax, handwritten notes on the back of an envelope. And contracts are often formed merely through verbal discussions. So the court is often asked to determine when these discussions and communications reach the point of forming a valid contract. The fundamental requirement for the contract to exist is an agreement, the meeting of the minds of the parties. Formation requires offer, acceptance and consideration. Often in a breach of contract lawsuit, the court is asked to investigate whether each of these components was present. Acceptance of a conditional offer only forms a contract when the conditions are met. As we will see when we look at duress and misrepresentation, Acceptance must be genuine to create contractual relations. One of the key issues to consider is intent. If the parties intended to make a contract, then the courts will generally support this intent. Sometimes, even where no contract was formed, the court will imply an obligation using its equity powers and create a quasi-contract. Contracts are enforced against sane adults not children or the mentally infirm. So a contract between two children would be unenforceable on both sides. However, a contract between a child and an adult would be enforceable by the child but not by the adult. The promise of the adult would be enforced by the court but the promise of the child would not. It's irrelevant if the adult was under the belief that the child was older than 18. The child's promise is still deemed unenforceable by the court for lack of capacity. The exception applies to the situation where the child enters a contract when aged 17, then gains capacity when reaches the age of 18. In the situation where the 17-year-old agrees to lease a car, the agreement is unenforceable by the lessor. When the child reaches the age of 18, the contract would be enforceable unless the child returns the car. By continuing to use the car after reaching the age of majority, the child impliedly affirmed the contract. The courts give special treatment to the necessaries of life, food, water, shelter. A promise that provides the necessaries of life will often be enforced, even when involving a child or incompetent lacking capacity. A contract that's required to be in writing by the statute of frauds, but is not in writing, is unenforceable in court. These contracts involve considerations for marriage, contracts that cannot be performed within one year, contracts for the transfer of an interest in land, promises by an executor of a will or estate to pay the debts of the estate himself, contracts for goods with a value of $500 or more, and promises to act as security or guarantor the debts of another. 
When asserting the statute of frauds as a defence, it's important to remember some significant exceptions and understand what the court is looking to achieve here. Under the statute of frauds, the court questions the validity of certain contracts and looks for substantial evidence that the contract was formed. A writing provides the evidence required by the court, but performance of the contract can also provide sufficient evidence. The court will enforce a contract that's been fully performed, with or without a writing. Full performance provides all the evidence required by the court. Treatment of part performance depends on whether we're working under the common law with service contracts, the common law pertaining to real estate transactions, or whether we're dealing with the sale of goods under the UCC. Part performance of a service or employment contract does not satisfy the statute of frauds, and applying the common law, the court will not enforce an unwritten contract that's been part performed and lacks a writing as required by the statute of frauds. Part performance of a real estate contract is sufficient for the court to enforce a promise as a contract when other evidence is available such as possession. When part payment for a real estate transfer has been made and possession passed from seller to buyer, the court will find a contract was formed, even in the absence of a writing. What constitutes a writing between merchants trading goods under the UCC is very broad. An order request from a merchant requesting a specific number of goods that lies unanswered for longer than 10 days will form a binding contract for the order under the UCC rules. The UCC will force a buyer to pay for goods received and will force a buyer to pay for specially manufactured custom built goods after manufacture has commenced. If no contract existed, why would the supplier deliver or manufacture the goods for the buyer? Delivery of finished goods is usually easy to determine. Part performance in specially manufactured goods is a little more interesting. The court applies a substantial beginning test to determine whether enough work has been done by the supplier to determine that the good is specially made. In the absence of a written contract, where one would be required under the statute of frauds, the buyer can be forced to pay for specially manufactured goods that have not been delivered, as long as the supplier has started the customization to the buyer's specifications. The delivery or, or manufacture provides evidence of the contract sufficient for a court applying the UCC for the sale of goods. It's important to recognize that the statute of frauds is all about evidence of the existence of a contract. Evidence of the contract can be found in court in the form of pleadings, discovery or testimony. If the contract was not written, but its existence was provided in evidence before a court, then this will be sufficient for the court to bind the parties to their obligations under the agreement. A contract signed as the result of holding a gun to the other party's head will be unenforceable in court. The courts will void a contract formed under these conditions as the agreement was somewhat less than voluntary. Similar to the situation for the unconscionability defence, the courts will increasingly consider threats of economic hardship as grounds to void the contract, especially where the victim is vulnerable. Misrepresentation is a false statement of fact made by one party to another party which has the effect of inducing that party into the contract. If a party to the contract was induced by a false statement of fact by the other party, then she can escape the contract or ask for damages if it's too late to escape. Fraud is intentional misrepresentation. As long as the matter is material, that it's important, then it doesn't have to be fraudulent to constitute breach of contract. An honest, innocent mistake can form misrepresentation. If the buyer asks the seller if the house has structural problems and the seller says no, then the contract of sale is invalid if structural problems are discovered. The contract is unenforceable by the seller on the grounds of misrepresentation, regardless of whether the seller knew of the structural problems or whether it was an honest mistake. 
The structural defect in a house is a material fact in a house sale transaction. So even an innocent mistake can constitute misrepresentation. A finding of misrepresentation allows for a remedy of rescission, cancellation of the contract and sometimes damages. Inadequate consideration is likely not enough to make a contract unenforceable. A mere peppercorn is usually sufficient. However, a court of law will consider evidence that one party to the contract took advantage of its superior bargaining power to insert provisions that make the agreement overwhelmingly favour their own interests. Usually, for a court to find a contract unconscionable, the party wishing to escape the contract will have to prove both that there was a problem with the substance of the contract and the process through which the contract was formed. The substantive problem will usually be the consideration, but could also be terms, interest payments, or other obligations the court finds unfair. Procedural issues that a court could consider include a party's lack of choice, superior bargaining position or knowledge, and other circumstances surrounding the bargaining process. The question of unconscionability is decided by the judge, not the jury, and is assessed at the time the contract was formed, not with the benefit of hindsight. Upon finding unconscionability, a court has a great deal of flexibility on remedies. It may refuse to enforce the contract, refuse to enforce the offending clause, or take other measures it deems necessary to have a fair outcome. Damages are usually not awarded. An illegal contract is unenforceable in court. There's a difference between an illegal subject matter and illegal purpose, however. If the subject matter of the contract is illegal, it cannot be enforced by either party. So a gambling debt in a no-gambling jurisdiction will not be enforced by the court. But a contract to sell playing cards and poker chips to the gamblers would not be illegal. The purpose of the contract, gambling, is illegal, but the subject matter, the sale of cards and chips, is not. A contract can be voidable as a result of mutual mistake of fact. If both buyer and seller believe the stone in the ring is diamond, but it turns out to be fake, the court will not enforce the contract to sell the ring. If, however, the stone is a diamond, but it's not worth the price of the sale, the court will enforce the contract. Not all mistakes void the contract. A mistake can void a contract only if the mistake of the subject matter was sufficiently fundamental to render its identity different from what was contracted, making the performance of the contract impossible. When the mistake is by one, not both, of the parties, the contract is still enforceable. So if the seller believed the stone was fake, but the buyer knew it to be diamond, the contract to sell would be enforced by the court. Parties to contracts are encouraged to take care and make sound decisions. They cannot ask the court to rectify mistakes that were obvious or palpable, easy to discover. When assessing whether mistakes of fact exist, the court will wind the clock backwards to the time the contract was formed and will not use the benefit of hindsight to investigate whether both parties were mistaken. Even though two parties may intend to make the contract and believe they've made a contract, the contract does not exist if the agreement is too indefinite. However, modern courts will tolerate a good deal of uncertainty before voiding a contract for indefiniteness. A contract for the sale of goods, governed by the UCC, is valid if the parties intended to make a contract and there's a reasonably certain basis for giving an appropriate remedy. Contracts for services and other contracts governed by the common law are sufficiently definite if the court is able to determine whether one party has breached and the court is able to reward some form of reasonable damages. The four essential elements necessary are identification of the parties, the subject matter of the contract, time for performance and price. The court will look to the common law and UCC to provide the missing terms. Ambiguity means that the language of the contract has more than one meaning 
and reasonable people could disagree over what the language means. In a classic case, a contract was made to sell 125 bales of cotton that were to arrive on a ship called Peerless that sailed from Bombay, India. Unknown to the parties to the contract, two ships of the same name were to arrive from the same port during different months of the same year. This extraneous fact created ambiguity in an otherwise clear and definite term of the contract. The court determined there was no contract on the grounds of ambiguity. After a court has applied rules of interpretation, such as the plain meaning, the course of dealing, the course of performance, or trade usage rules to the unclear terms, the court can still not say with certainty what meaning was intended by the parties of the contract. When this occurs, the court will admit as evidence extraneous proof of prior or contemporaneous agreements to determine the meaning of the ambiguous language. Sometimes courts decide the meaning of ambiguous language on the basis of who was responsible or at fault for the ambiguity. When one party knew or should have known of the ambiguity, the unsuspecting party's subjective knowledge of the meaning will control. The contract would be interpreted as understood by the innocent party. If both parties knew or should have known of the uncertainty, the court will look to the subjective understanding of both. The ambiguity no longer exists if the parties agree upon its meaning. If the parties disagree and the ambiguous provisions are material, no contract is formed for lack of mutual assent. There are several situations where performance of a contractual obligation can be excused. They generally fall into two categories. Performance of party A is excused by lack of performance by party B or is excused by agreement between A and B. If homeowner contracts builder to build a fence six foot high around her property to prevent deer eating her plants and the builder constructs a two foot fence, this would be considered a material or major breach by the builder and would excuse the homeowner of her duty to pay. The homeowner doesn't have to wait for the builder to breach if breach can be anticipated. Let's say the builder tells the homeowner, I know I agreed to build you the fence, but I can't get hold of the materials. The builder has repudiated his obligation to build the fence, and the homeowner's duty to pay is excused. The homeowner also has a right to sue the builder for breach of contract. However, if the builder is able to quickly secure the materials, the repudiation can be retracted, and the homeowner's obligation to pay for the fence when constructed would be revived. If the homeowner prom promises the builder, I'll give you my car if you build me a fence. Then the car is stolen before the fence is constructed. The builder is relieved of his duties to build the fence on the grounds that the homeowner was unable to perform. This is similar to anticipated breach or anticipatory repudiation. A party to a contract can also be excused performance by later agreement. Later agreements come in various forms. Cancellation or rescission of the contract can take place if performance by both sides has not been completed. An accord and satisfaction is another form of later agreement that involves both parties agreeing to replace one type of performance with another. When the new agreement is performed, the old agreement disappears. The old agreement does not disappear in the accord, but in the satisfaction. A modification is a binding agreement by the parties to alter the terms of the contract. Modification is a new contract that affects the performance obligations of the old one. Performance can be excused when performance is rendered impossible as the result of a later unforeseen event. If performance is still possible, it's not excused. So if a fire destroys the original Picasso painting that was being sold under the contract, performance is rendered impossible, so performance is excused. The buyer cannot sue the seller for breach as the seller was excused on grounds of impossibility. 
But if the contract covers the sale of a hundred blank painting canvases that are destroyed by fire, the canvases are replaceable, so performance is not excused, as performance is still within the realms of possibility. Where impossibility concerns the duties specified in the contract, frustration of purpose concerns the reason a party entered into the contract. Frustration of purpose can relieve the party of the contract of his duties to perform as the result of a later unforeseen event. The US follows the leading case in English law, the 1903 case of Krell v. Henry, which concerned a hotel customer who had rented a room for the purpose of watching the coronation procession of King Edward VII. When the king fell ill, the coronation was indefinitely postponed. The customer refused to pay for the room. The hotel owner sued for breach of contract and the customer then countersued for the return of his £25 deposit. The court determined that the cancellation of the coronation was unforeseeable by the parties and discharged the contract, leaving the parties as they were. The customer lost his one-third deposit and the room owner lost the rest of the rent. The court said performance was not impossible as the customer could have taken the apartment and viewed the street where the coronation was to take place, although there were no events actually taking place. Unclean hands is an equitable defence in which the defendant argues that the plaintiff is not entitled to obtain an equitable remedy on account of the fact that the plaintiff is acting unethically or has acted in bad faith with respect to the subject matter of the complaint, that is, acted with unclean hands. The defendant has the burden of proof to show the plaintiff is not acting in good faith. The doctrine is often stated as, those seeking equity must do equity, or equity must come with clean hands. A defendant's unclean hands can also be claimed and proven by the plaintiff to claim other equitable remedies and prevent the defendant from asserting equitable affirmative defences. In other words, Unclean hands can be used offensively by the plaintiff as well as defensively by the defendant. For more information on equitable defences, see the slideshow on remedies.